Good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to the Anglican Church of the Good Shepherd in Calgary. I'm the Reverend Derwin Kostanak, the priest of the parish, and I'm glad you've joined us for what is now going to be the third of five vital signs of the body of Christ. As we've been working our way through the season of Epiphany, we've been taking a look at these aspects of our plan for mission, how they dovetail in with what the diocese has been providing for us as a plan for rejuvenating and revitalizing the church. But no matter how you package it, these things that we've been discussing are indeed essential to what it means to be living as a member of the body of Christ. And so we talked about evangelism and worship already, and this morning, Margaret Hogarth, our pastoral intern, will be speaking to us about discipleship. And so I'm going to let her say all that she is going to say about that in a few moments, but first let us turn to the scriptures and hear our readings for today. And so we begin with a reading from the second letter of Peter. God's divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Thus he has given us through these things his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants of the divine nature. For this very reason you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness and goodness with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness, and godliness with mutual affection, and mutual affection with love. For if these things are yours and are increasing among you, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For anyone who lacks these things is short-sighted and blind, and is forgetful of the cleansing of past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more eager to confirm your call and election, for if you do this, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Jesus and his new disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent! And come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? With authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of Christ now at this time, I invite Margaret Hogarth to come and to deliver the sermon for us this morning. Imagine a young couple has a new baby. Let's say it's a baby girl. Healthy and happy. The new parents take care of her, feed her, and change her. They protect her and keep her safe. As her girl gets a little older, they help her sit up, then crawl, and then finally to walk. When she falls, they pick her up, dust her off, and encourage her to try again. They teach her to feed herself, teach her words, like colors and shapes and the names of animals. They help her learn to dress herself, and eventually to get herself off to school. As she grows, they help her navigate her personal relationships and her emotional ups and downs. Finally, they advise her on her education, her career, her choice of a mate. When she's ready to become a mother herself, they help her through the pregnancy and through those first terrifying months of child rearing. But none of this happens automatically. No one is born knowing how to think and do what an adult thinks and does. 
The job of parents is to lovingly and safely raise their child into adulthood. The parents are intentional and deliberate and repetitive in what they do. They think carefully about how to do it, what to do for her, when to help, and when to let her figure it out on her own. Our church is something like these parents. The church is in the business of taking those new in the faith and seeing that they grow in their faith in Jesus. Together we, as the church, teach them to talk, as it were, and to walk in the faith. Now we have people at various levels of maturity in the faith. Some need encouragement. Others can provide that encouragement. All of us need to continue to grow. And I would venture to say that we're never done learning in this life. And we will never on earth say that we have arrived at fully living the life of faith. In the Gospel reading in Mark today, we read that Jesus is attending the synagogue. Elsewhere in the Gospel of Luke, we read that this was Jesus' custom on the Sabbath. He would have learned the habit when he was growing up. The community would gather at the synagogue on the Sabbath to listen to the reading of the Law and the Prophets. Like our sermons today, somebody would continue with the teaching on what had been read. Coming just before our reading in Mark today is the reading of Jesus calling his first disciples, Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They left their fishing business to follow him. Now we read that Jesus, with them, attended the synagogue on the Sabbath. Jesus was the one teaching this day. We don't know exactly what was read or what he was teaching. But in a manner of speaking, he was teaching his new disciples, just like he was teaching everybody else that was present. And they all noticed that Jesus taught with authority, not like the other teachers taught. Jesus didn't quote other authorities. He didn't just repeat what was traditional. He was original. He was his own man. I would say the writer of the Gospel of Mark is almost obsessed with Jesus as a teacher. The author uses the word teacher 17 times and only ever in reference to Jesus. He uses the verb to teach 12 times referring to Jesus. To Mark, Jesus is the supreme teacher. And Jesus' teaching is not just the words he was using, but also his actions. The casting out of the demon in the presence of everybody there was part of his teaching. Jesus was living out his message of the coming of the kingdom of God and the putting of everything right. The response of the people, and I like to think this includes his first disciples, was astonishment. They actually asked each other, who is this guy? He's teaching something new and different with authority, and even demons obey him. They felt so strongly that we read they argued about it. As you may have guessed, and as Derwin told you, I'm going to continue to talk about the teaching function of the church. This function is also known as discipleship or formation. It's one of the five vital signs of the body of Christ. Derwin has covered two of those in the last two Sundays. He talked about evangelism as sharing good news and about us being hardwired for worship. Now we go on to discipleship. Discipleship is teaching individuals and the church community as a whole how to grow in their faith. I want to highlight three things about discipleship. First, it's intentional. We need to go out of our way to do it. Second, it's incarnational. It's not just intellectual knowledge, but it's how to live day to day. Thirdly, it's done in community. It's not something you can do completely on your own. 
So think again about our young couple with the new baby. They would do their best to teach that child good manners. She would learn how to say please and thank you, to share, to open doors for people. They would teach her table manners. This training is intentional, deliberate, and repetitive. The idea is the child learns at home among family. Then when the child's out in society, she knows how to behave properly. She knows what is polite. And she knows she can do it because she's done it at home among family. Here's another example. Consider the Canadian military. They are tasked with defending, protecting, and serving the people, lands, and waters of Canada. No one enters the military already a great soldier. No, the first thing that happens is they go to basic training and they learn what it means to be a soldier. Then when they are called on for real, they know they can do it because they've done it in training. Again, we have something similar in the church. When one is baptized, especially if you're a baby, one doesn't automatically know the faith and grow in it. We teach intentionally. The baby's parents and the people of the church take deliberate steps to teach the child the faith. Things like, who is God? What's God like? Who is Jesus? What did Jesus do and say? How do we live for Jesus today? When the child is older, the church holds catechism or confirmation classes to teach the child the fundamentals of the faith. The child learns the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and what every phrase of these treasures mean. The child learns about baptism and the Eucharist. Then she goes on to confirm her baptismal vows for herself in what we call a confirmation service. We, as the church, take intentional steps to see that those who are baptized grow in their faith and learn to take it as their own. Moving beyond catechism, we see that the teaching function of the church is not all about what one knows and what one can recite. The church is in the business of making disciples of Jesus. This involves more than just knowing or believing things. It involves a way of being. It is character, the character of Jesus. That's what the church works to instill in its members. And you know what they say about character. Character is who you are when nobody's looking. The faith is not an intellectual exercise. It's a way of life. It is lived. It is incarnational. We put flesh on what we believe and we act differently because of that belief. We are called to love God and love our neighbor as ourself. Now this love isn't a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. It's an act of the will, a deliberate decision to work for the well-being of the other person. Scripture is our source as to what God is like and what God requires of us. There are several summaries of what God requires. Love God and love your neighbor is what the Jewish law taught. And Jesus confirmed these when he named the two greatest commandments. The author of the Gospel of John tells us that Jesus told his disciples quite succinctly, love one another as I have loved you. And he loved them sacrificially. Then from the Hebrew Bible, we also hear the prophet Micah, who wrote that God wants us to add to our worship and giving a change in our way of being. Micah writes, what does the Lord God require of thee? But to act justly, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. All of these summaries involve behavior and attitude, not just knowing something or agreeing with a position. 
They take us beyond belief into the way of living our lives. In our first reading, the author of 2 Peter provides us with a list of virtues. Now, a list of Christian characteristics was not uncommon in that day. But every one of these lists started with faith and culminated in love. The middle steps would vary. But each step built on the one beneath it. And finally, all of those are perfected in love. This list starts with faith and then adds goodness. So what is goodness? I would suggest that goodness is doing what one knows to be right. Then adding to goodness is knowledge. Does this mean knowing stuff? Yes and no. Goodness here, I think, means knowing more of what is good and right in order to do what is good and right. Then knowledge leads to self-control. Self-control is consciously choosing to do what is good and right, even when it's difficult. Endurance, sorry, self-control leads to endurance. And endurance is the ability to carry on in doing what is good and right in the faith of difficulty. Endurance leads to godliness. Godliness is godly character. Being and acting like God because it's natural for us to do that. At this point, acting like God is our normal way of being rather than the exception. Then godliness leads to mutual affection. Mutual affection is caring for and enjoying those you're with. Mutual affection matures into love. Love, like I said, is the desire for the well-being of the other, even if you don't like them, even when they cut you off in traffic, and even when you don't agree with them. Then the author goes on to explain that having these character traits in increasing measure that is, you're getting better and better at displaying them. And if they are more and more evident in our community, that will keep us from being ineffective and unfruitful in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. Building on our initial faith and growing in these virtues will result in our being effective and fruitful in the Christian faith. And that Christian faith is not meant to be lived out in isolation. The life of faith to which we are called as followers of Jesus is one that involves Christian community. Jesus called 12 men to be his closest followers. And they were with him and they learned from him. They were their own little community. Our community is the church. The church is our family of faith. Like the young child being taught how to behave politely in public, we learn how to live the life of faith among our church family. And hopefully our church family cuts us some slack, just like our family at home does when we're having a bad day. In our church community, we learn and we practice how to be patient with one another, how to control our exasperation, or our anger with each other. We learn how to speak the truth and to speak the truth in love. We also practice being kind and faithful. If we practice in our church community, then when we are called to behave in society with the character of Christ, we know what to do and we know we can do it because we've practiced amongst our church community. Now, such learning takes more interaction than we get worshiping together, listening to readings, and taking in a sermon once a week. We practice our Christian behavior when we interact with one another. Of course, right now we're prevented from getting together due to the pandemic. But think about when times were normal or near normal. 
Our interactions with each other were opportunities to practice living the faith. And what were those interactions? Here were a few. Attending or teaching Sunday school together, serving on altar guild or parish council, or even providing coffee and goodies after the service. There were also opportunities when flipping pancakes or barbecuing hot dogs or cleaning the church grounds on our cleanup Saturday. We also had opportunity during study classes and Bible studies. Even our Tuesday evening Zoom meetings now to discuss the sermon is a chance to practice living our faith together. We practice the character of Jesus and help each other to grow into Jesus' likeness. We can think again of our military example. The Canadian military have an overarching mission to protect, defend, and serve Canada. But they may be called on to serve in a variety of instances. Maybe the UN calls for peacekeepers. Maybe there's a wildfire or a flood, a snow blizzard or a heat wave. Or as we've seen, long-term care facilities need help with caring for their residents. To be ready, the military is constantly training. They know what they are capable of and they work together as a unit. They train in a variety of ways so they'll be ready when they are called on for a specific mission. The church is similar. Our overarching mission is to love God and love our neighbor. As I said, there's other summaries, but let's go with this for now. At church, we learn, practice, train, and become proficient in expressing that love. So when situations in life call for a display of that love, we know we can do it because we've done it before. We can do it with our work colleagues, or our classmates, or our teammates, or even those we run into doing errands. We can display the character of Jesus because we practiced at church among friends. So to bring these different strands together, discipleship is not automatic once you come to faith in Jesus. We must intentionally engage to grow. The teaching of the church is not head knowledge. We must work to make the faith our way of being in the world. It's a character thing, not an intellectual thing. And while there are elements that each of us can do on our own, like scripture reading or prayer or fasting, there are other parts of the faith that we can only learn and practice in community. That's why we come together, not just to worship. We come together to learn and grow and practice our Christian behavior with each other. Let me ask you this. How can you be intentional in your growth? Can you use this time in lockdown to good purpose? Maybe reading the Bible more or praying? Or perhaps you could explore fasting. Traditionally, that means staying away from food. But you can also fast from social media or TV or alcohol or sugar. Can you develop a regular habit of solitude and silence before God? Or a practice of simplicity or generosity? These, and there are many more, are called spiritual disciplines. The idea is to practice these, usually one at a time, and we do these in daily life, even when it's inconvenient or difficult, so that we know we can draw on that experience when real life calls for a display of that characteristic. We know how to express the character of Christ. So let's think back to our imaginary couple with that new baby girl. If God is the parent, the church is the family. And each of us is that child. Let us each ask ourselves, where am I in my development? Where do I need to continue to grow in my faith? 
What can I do to help myself grow? Are there spiritual practices I can try now? See if they work for me? What lessons have I learned that I can share with someone else? How have I taken my faith and made it relevant to my life? And could I share that with someone else? We all need to be deliberate in growing in the faith. And we all need to live out that faith. We are called not just to live out that faith, but to help each other continue to do so. It is my prayer that we will use this time to good purpose and that when we can gather again and interact with each other, we will continue to use our way of doing church together to train, to love God, and love our neighbor. Amen.